Thank you very much. I'd like to take a few seconds to thank Anne, of course, for the invitation. Um, I feel very honored to be here with so many people who have inspired my, my work and continue to inspire me, so it's a pleasure. I would like to talk a little bit about hibernation in dwarf lemurs. Um, I know hibernation is kind of a unique strategy within primates, um, but it's pretty common among mammals. Uh, and I think still most people will think when they think about hibernation, you know, you usually think about a cold environment, uh, with predictably seasonal, or like large portion of the year you don't have resources and it's very cold and it's, you know, hard to keep warm. And so you really hibernation makes sense under those conditions. Uh, but if you think, you know, places like Madagascar, uh, where you find a mosaic of habitats with all these different environments from dry forest, almost like desert-like environments to rainforest to high elevation forest. Think about in almost all these places, you would find at least one type or more than one species of dwarf lemur hibernating. So that's hibernation look like the same across all the species and habitats. And we are just beginning to document uh, you know, what hibernation looks like and the patterns or profiles of hibernation in, um, in some of these dwarf lemur species. So what I would like to do today is to take you in sort of a simple descriptive mini tour of what we are beginning to know about dwarf lemur hibernation. So I will introduce you to the dwarf lemurs, this small um, group of nocturnal lemurs. And this is a very simplistic um, phylogeny. Um, there are a lot more species and probably species that are being described as, as we speak now. But I want to emphasize sort of like the four main lineages of dwarf lemurs and, and how these groups of dwarf lemurs sort of occupy particular habitats. And, and the fact is we don't know much about hibernation in most of them, so I will focus on these four groups. The first, Carogallia cebrii. So this is your high altitude specialist. This Carogallia is only found in high elevation forests. As you can see, the distribution is really patchy. There are not many rain for high elevation rainforest environments in Madagascar left. Um, it's also, you can see, sort of the first branch coming off of the Carogallia lineage, and we can imagine that maybe they have retained this sort of ancestral condition. So it's a cold adapted dwarf lemur. Then we have the fat tails. So the fat tail dwarf lemurs, uh, that's the species that you can actually see at the DLC. That's the smallest species of dwarf lemur. Um, the distribution is not as big. I mean, I'm just trying to roughly um, show you that um, they mainly occupy like, the dry forest. Um, of Madagascar, although they can also be found in uh, some places in the southeast, in littoral forest, and um, also in the northeast. But imagine, for simplification, and, um, that your fat tails, your Carogallus medius, are your dry forest specialist. So these animals are going to be exposed to high daily tempor temperature fluctuations, and that, in a way, is going to affect their hibernation patterns, as we will see. Then we have Carogallus crosslei. So we are going to the east. Um, again, the distribution is not as large as, as you know, I'm showing there. Uh, but you pretty much find these species um, anywhere on the east, if it's low elevation, even in highly disturbed, fragmented forests, uh, and to high elevation uh, sites as well. So crosslei can actually be found by themselves or with other dwarf lemur species. Call it rainforest opportunist, and I will probably, um, you will know why I call them like that. And finally, your largest species of dwarf lemur. This is kind of a giant within the group. Um, it's mainly fi found in low elevation forest. I have to tell you that if you really want to make sure that you know what the species of dwarf lemur you are studying, you really need to get them in hand, um, capture them. If you are at night with a flashlight in a closed canopy um, rainforest, 
and you just see eye shine. It's very hard to tell whether it's a crossly eye or major. So in the literature, you know, sometimes these species are reported, but we don't really know which of the two. We need to do more sampling and um, morphological reporting and, and genetic analysis. So these are the four sort of types of dwarf lemurs that I'm going to talk about. And before I take you in the mini tour, I want to just mention a couple of facts on hibernation. Um, these are very simple and they may be exceptions, but uh, just so you can follow what I'm going to be saying, when you are hibernating, your body temperature will approximate the temperature of your immediate environment where you are hibernating. And so that means that your metabolism is going to slow down as your temperature decreases. Um, and so think about you know, where you're hibernating in a tree hole, will feel differently you know, than if you're hibernating underground. Um, when the animals hibernate, they are not dead, they are still alive. There are some physiological functions that still must occur when you hibernate, although they will be slowed down. Your heart rate will be significantly decreased, your breathing rates, so some physiological functions will continue at a lower pace. Others will be halted altogether. So you're not growing when you hibernate. Your teeth are not erupting when you hibernate. Um, you are not reproductively active. Um, so because some um, functions, functions might, you know, must occur, um, when the individuals are hibernating, they sort of have to heat up, rewarm, reach high body temperature at a regular interval to actually keep these processes going. Um, something interesting about tropical hibernators um, and dwarf lemurs in particular, uh, hibernating in, in areas like the West, and I, I'm gonna show you in a minute, is that they can possibly reach high body temperature depending on where they are hibernating. And that means they might not need to use endogenous um, uh, fat storage. They need to um, arouse. Um, they can just follow a sort of track the ambient temperature. So I'm just going to focus on body temperature as the parameter to sort of compare all these different care values. Um, we are measuring other things, but I'm just going to focus on these. So the first stop in the tour is so the dry forest. Um, of Kirindi, um, you now we have the world expert um, here sitting who did all the work in Kirindi and sort of reported all this hibernation work. So I'm a little intimidated. I'm not going to talk much about Kirindi, but um, I'm just going to mention that Carogallius medios in Kirindi, they always hibernate in tree holes. And so there are different kinds of trees and different kinds of holes, I guess. So I'm going to here exemplify like the two extremes of a range. Uh, for Carogallius medius in the, in the bottom, you see if they happen to be hibernating in a sort of a large tree, thick wall tree, sort of in a buffer environment. That individual will remain, their temperature, which is in dark, the dark line, will sort of remain stable for days, right? Approximating the temperature inside that tree hole and they will eventually arouse. They will heat up, things will happen, and they will go back into hibernation. However, if a dwarf lemur is hibernating in sort of a thin tree, a tree that will get really hot during the day and cold during the night, um, well, the animals will be doing the same. So you see the dark line is going up when it gets hot and it's going down when it gets cold. That means that this animal is, again, is passively tracking up and down. So it's not arousing in the sort of a traditional sense. Um, and of course, you will have things in between. Three holes that are sort of warm, but not too hot. And so dwarf lemurs will arouse or they will not, depending on the sort of a insulation uh, capacity of the, the trees where they are actually hibernating. And hibernation here can last up to eight months a year, which is um, sort of a record. Uh, most of the work that I did with my colleagues uh, was in a high plateau site um, at Sinjorivu, um, 
close to the capital. It's a um, sort of fragmented area. There are more than one species of dwarf lemur, but I will focus here on the Kerogalo zebrii. Remember, you're a high altitude specialist. And what we notice, you know, when you think about tropical forest, um, you don't expect to bring your winter jacket with you, and it was extremely cold. And so this is sort of the, the habitat where hibernation really makes sense. When you are there in the winter time, um, it can drop um, to freezing temperatures sometimes. You see frost there, and that was September um, in the bottom right photo. So at this site, Kerogalio cibrii will, um, will occupy tree holes during the active season. When they are not hibernating, they are in tree holes. But when they hibernate, they sort of go down to the ground, and there is a lemur there. Um, there was no exception to this rule. All the Kerogalio cibrii will hibernate underground, and you can imagine that. Um, there is a reason for it, or maybe more than one, but if you know, temperatures get really low and there is a risk of freezing, the soil will represent the most stable and buffer environment that they can find. And this is sort of the temperature profile of one particular individual, and you see those sort of like peaks, those are the arousals that happen every seven to 10 days. And then the rest of the time where the animal is hibernating, it will go down and it will track the soil temperature. So in the core, of the hibernation season in you know, June and July, that soil will get down to like 12, 15 degrees Celsius, and that's pretty much the temperature of these individuals. And this particular female hibernating, hibernated in the same place for seven months without moving. So maybe this is obvious, but when the animals arouse, they don't need to move, they don't need to change places. They sort of like are curled up in a ball, they heat up for less than a day, and then they sort of go down. So this particular animal, we know for sure, it should stay in the same, in the same place. So we go from high elevation rainforest, we are going down a little bit in elevation. So this is an example uh, for their third type of Caragallus, or Caragallus crosslei, in a mid elevation sort of mountain forest in Ambatubi. So we are you know, going down in elevation, this is a place where you don't really find a lot of temperature extremes. It doesn't get extremely hot, like Kirindi, or extremely cold at night. Um, and so there is a little more of a, um, uh, there is a difference, I guess, in the way that these animals may be um, used in the environment. So, Carogales crosslei here, they can sleep in tree holes, but they can also sleep in nest, nest-like structures, sometimes in, you know, and kind of elaborated um, nest, and sometimes just you know a bunch of like dry leaves. Um, they can also be found hibernating underground, like we just saw at Sinjaribu. Um, but they can occasionally continue to hibernate in nests. So we, we start to see a bit of flexibility in in the use of the environment and in the hibernation sort of patterns. And here you will see this is one particular individual. Uh, the rectangle is showing the temperature profile of that individual when, when he was hibernating in the nest. You know, if you can see very well, the little fluctuation, not the peaks, but you know, the, the little fluctuation uh, when, when the animal is hibernating, and then it moved to the ground. And now you get sort of a more flat uh, line as you know, the temperature in the soil is, is more stable. So animals at this particular forest can hibernate up to five months, um, and anywhere in between three to five. So you see sort of the trend, the, the coldest environment or the driest sites, you get the longest hibernation periods as you're going low in elevation, your dwarf lemur gets sort of bigger and hibernating for, for a fewer months. All right, so we are going even lower now. We are. Um, this is a site in Marojeji, and I have to say, Marojeji National Park in the north, you get pretty much all the different kinds of rainforest that you can imagine, from low elevation to mountain to high elevation forest. It's a mountainous uh, park and with a very um, impressive elevational gradient. So we decided to go, you know, we found in Google Earth what would be the lowest 
point in the park and we went there to do some sampling to see which dwarf lemur was living and we found the Kerogalius major, the largest one. Um, and here, we don't really have a lot of data. We have one individual and she was sleeping in the non-hibernating season, she was sleeping inside a tree hole and then we waited and waited and waited and she stayed in the same place. She hibernated in the same tree for months. Um, this particular animal, yeah, 3.5 3 months in the same um, hole. And what you see, the rectangle as the hibernation season. And so you start to see a little bit of a fluctuation. I mean, that tree so it got a little hot during the day, cold at night, but not hot enough. So the animal is still had to rouse. So you see all these peaks. And so you see during the, the core of the, of the hibernation, the animal is arousing every couple of days. Um, so, you know, it's still a slightly different what you would see in a species at a high elevation or mountain um, site. Um, and this one, so this is sort of the future. You know, we are now trying to, you know, we have all these different sites and we have all these different species and we are trying to find a place where we have sort of the same species under different conditions and see what, you know, what may happen. Try to you not know, tease apart what would be sort of your species signature compared to the habitat signature. How much phenotypic plasticity there is. If you put a medius in the east, will it be, you know, a medius-like thing or would it be doing a rainforest thing? So we are, you know, we are just beginning to collect data on these animals, you know, looking at sleep patterns, see whether if you are arousing, using your fat stores, and so you are using thermogenesis, are you going to show sort of the same sleep pattern as if you were, at, you know, passively tracking? You're not using your fat stores, but you are just heating up and cooling down, cooling down as the trees get hot and cold. We are, just beginning to look at that. We continue to monitor metabolic rates, uh, how much energy these animals are saving uh, by you know, hibernating under different conditions. And we still need to do a lot of behavioral ecology. Maybe I would take this opportunity to see if there are students out there who really want to work at night in a rainforest and try to track a tiny animal on the top of the canopy, because we need more to understand what these animals are eating, you know, the dietary flexibility. We can look at physiological flexibility, but we need to know more about ecology to put these things together. So this is sort of what we are going through, like just the comparison with the medius from the West and looking at what the medius like animal is doing in the rainforest um, and, and see what, what are the differences and similarities. So going back to that tree, simple tree, um, to summarize, we found uh, your high plateau specialist, your CBRI, is always um, is sleeping in tree holes and hibernating underground, up to seven months a year. Your Kerogalius medius occupying the dry forests, they always, always sleep or hibernate in tree holes, up to eight months a year. Your Kerogalius crosslea, your opportunist, um, they can do a lot of things. They can sleep in tree holes, in nests. I saw one animal actually sleeping on the ground on a steep slope. That was an oddity. But they can also hibernate depending on where they are, underground or in nests. And then your largest, the Kerogalius major, they are also sort of flexible in that they are found tree holes, nest, and also the underground hibernation, you know, um, is, is a possibility, although again, have, um, the animal that I just showed you that was hibernating in a tree hole and then another animal that was hibernating underground, so we need more, more data. So I'm going to take the liberty to propose an, a scenario um, and what, may have happened um, or sort of the, the use of the environment as these different lineages of Kerogalius diversify. So we are assuming that the Kerogalius cibrii is sort of retaining the ancestral condition, your call adapted dwarf lemur. And they probably 
in order to benefit from hibernation, they were trying to find the most buffer insulated conditions. Um, and so they were moving from tree holes to the underground um, sites to um, maximize hibernation. As these Kerogalios are occupying the dry forest of Madagascar, um, they were using the tree holes and maybe they wanted to go to the ground. But if you were to go to a place like Kirindi, I would dare you to try to make a hole in the ground. It's really hard. Uh, I suspect that it's not possible to really do that. So I guess the option for the Kerogalios there is to find the largest um, trees with the better insulation properties, but you can imagine that they may not be enough trees for all the Kerogalios. So the ones that are left to hibernate in thin trees may actually be at risk, risk of overheating or freezing. So um, that might not be the ideal situation. As the dwarf lemurs sort of went to the east this time, um, they are going you know, lower in elevation, there is a little bit more of relaxation in the um, temperature extremes. So they begin to use um, the landscape a little bit more flexibly. You start to see occupations in nests, hibernation occurring in nests as well. So as the, the temperature gets warmer, then there is a relaxation in hibernation um, and also a shortening in the hibernation period. Remember, when you are hibernating, you're not reproducing. So you may take advantage of um, extending your active season if the conditions are more benevolent. So summary of the proposed scenario. Uh, we think that ancestral condition was to find buffer sleeping sites that resulted also in buffer hibernacula to maximize energetic savings from hibernation. Um, the exposure to these high daily temperature fluctuations in the poorly insulated tree holes maybe are not the ideal situation, but it's sort of the animals that were left with, you know, whatever tree holes um, were left after the, you know, other dwarf lemurs took the good trees. Um, and then under more relaxed conditions, then hibernation became more relaxed, and maybe the trend is for hibernation periods to, um, to be shorter. So why, why we cared about this? Of course, you want to tell stories, and, and this is a, you know, interesting story to try to put together sort of the history of uh, Kerogalios and document the variability. Um, we also want to know, um, depending on the characteristics of, of their, you know, the ecology and the hibernation patterns, that might give us an indication of whether there are differences in the vulnerability of these species to disturbance. And so that's another, you know, an aspect that we want to take into consideration, see whether some of these carogalios are more or less vulnerable to, um, to disturbance and climate change. And of course, there is a whole area of research that is trying to understand hibernation and see whether it could be applied to humans or at least Part of it, you know, assuming that all mammals share the machinery for hibernation, and there will be a talk later. But. So I am proposing that if you're interested in knowing more about hibernation with a potential application to humans, for example, let's go and study the Kerogalios that are hibernating under sort of more relaxed conditions, these eastern Kerogalios, uh, whether you see hibernation. Um, without significant hypothermia when you see animals hibernating that they are not extremely fat. So I think it's, it's important to bring these animals into the equation and see what are the differences, genetic or uh, otherwise, that differentiate these different lineages. So the talk was about biodiversity um, and hibernation and I think, I know this is sort of a team effort, a team effort being in the forest a team effort of bringing research to the forest, but also a team effort about discussing what the potential is. And when we go to the forest, we collect samples. And I think it's important to identify what is it, you know, the biological diversity, the genetic diversity among these Kerogalios. 
and ideally try to find sort of this directionality and the temporal death of these lineages. Um, and if we have paleoclimatic reconstructions, and if we know more about the ecology uh, of hibernation and metabolism and diet, we can actually put together the story of um, Carogalios. And if we know all of that, we can actually assess vulnerability and try to bring that information into conservation action um, and try to predict what the long-term survival of these species may be. And of course, there's a lot of people here um, you know, in Anne's lab that um, hopefully will be working with the genetic aspect of it. I've been working with, with Peter, um, Andrew, and Katrin, who are you know, all here. Uh, on the sort of the forest um, field data uh, physiology of hibernation. And I'm also working with, uh, yeah, so Charlie on the aspect of conservation. So we, in a few years, would like to put all these pieces together and maybe have a more technical, um, comprehensive talk. And of course, Malagasy people, they all, you know, there are people who actually make this work possible because I cannot climb trees, I don't really see anything at night, and I'm very clumsy, so they really make it possible. Thank you. <laughs>